Uh, we have here to my immediate left, Shibli Telhami of the Brookings Institution. Uh, you are probably all extremely familiar with uh, Shibli, who's uh, 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 written uh, extensively for several decades about uh, primarily uh, U.S. policy toward the Middle East, but he's also an expert on the, uh, on the Arab-Israeli conflict. Uh, there's nobody who's better informed about uh, public attitudes toward the U.S. Middle Eastern relations, whether in the Middle East or, or, or in the United States. Uh, he is a, he is a, a non-resident fellow in the Saban Center, and he is also the Anwar Sadat Chair at the University of Maryland. Next to Shibli is Dalia Mugahed. Uh, she is uh, from the Gallup organization. She is the director, uh, she is the executive director of their center for the study of attitudes in the Muslim world. Uh, she is also a co-author of the book, uh, Who Speaks for Islam? And she has been uh, an advisor to the, uh, to the White House. Uh, she is deeply informed about Muslim attitudes toward these, toward these questions. And then on the far left, we have uh, William Galston, who uh, is uh, uh, one of the foremost experts on, uh, on U.S. politics. He is uh, the Ezra Zilcha Chair uh, of Governance Studies at Brooklyn, at uh, Brooklyn, at Brookings, uh, and he is also uh, he's also a professor at the University of Maryland as well. He has written uh, eight books, 100 articles, and just to make us all feel really bad, he writes a column every week uh, in the New Republic. Now. Uh, I think I'd like to turn first to you, Shibley, and uh, uh, just ask if you could give us a, um, a, a little bit of sense about U.S. public attitudes toward the elections with respect to the, the Middle East. What kind of effect are they going to have? Well, thanks, Mike. It's, uh, it's a pleasure to be with you on the panel. It's a pleasure to be with uh, Dahlia and Bill. Um, uh, what, if you look at uh, the issue of foreign policy broadly, and certainly Middle Eastern issues, they're certainly not at the core of our election campaign this time around. They're not central, although I think with the exception of Iran, where Iran could become a central issue, particularly between, in the ele between now and the election. I'll talk about that a little bit. Uh, nonetheless, um, foreign policy is an important issue, as you will see in a variety of ways, a relevant issue for the campaign. Uh, and there are important differences. Uh, not only between the candidates on Middle East issues, but also, as you will see, uh, between constituencies, Republican constituencies, Democratic constituencies, in a matter that is bound to be consequential uh, after the election. Uh, so let me start uh, with just outlining attitudes toward uh, several of the issues that the U.S. faces in the Middle East. Let me start with the Arab-Israeli issue. Now, the Arab-Israeli issue is not likely to affect the vote in the coming election much. Um, and that even is true of the core constituencies, uh, Jewish Americans and evangelicals. Uh, most Jewish Americans will vote uh, for the Democratic candidate. Uh, you know, it could vary 10 percentage points. Uh, most of the evangelical right will, will vote Republican. Not much is likely to happen between now and then that is going to affect how people are going to vote based on this issue. Uh, Nonetheless, it is important for fundraising. It always is. Um, uh, Pro-Israel uh, supporters in the U.S. Uh, tend to be generous in their contributions to campaigns, both to Democrats and Republicans, which is one reason why mo no one really wants to rock the boat on this issue in terms of fundraising. This year, it is especially sensitive. And it is sensitive because of this phenomenon, the super PACs, that had been ruled by our Supreme Court to be legal, uh, that provides uh, enormous spending by private citizens without really much accountability, while being able to distance themselves from candidates and therefore be much more extreme in what they preach. And we don't fully understand how this is going to play itself out. This is going to affect every issue, not just Middle East, because uh, obviously, you know, uh, 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 everyone who is interested in influencing the election in some way is going to weigh in. That does include the Arab-Israeli issue. And one particular player that has been central has been a, a huge giver who is a supporter of Prime Minister Netanyahu, Sheldon Adelson, 
um, who single-handedly funded the campaign of one of the Republican candidates, Newt Gingrich, in the tune of 20 million plus dollars, uh, who's now meeting with Romney, who met with Romney the last couple of days about uh, more spending. And, and so we know that the spending issue is going to be uh, important, much more perhaps than before. Um, uh, there are also huge and expanding differences between Republicans and Democratic constituencies on this issue. It's really fascinating uh, for those of us who watch American policy in the Middle East, uh, how over time uh, the Republican Party has become the constituency of the right wing in Israel, and much more so than any, at any point in history we've been tracing that. And let me just give you two examples of this in terms of the public attitudes. Uh, one of the questions that I ask and I have been asking for years, really for almost 20 years, which is whether the public wants American foreign policy to lean toward Israel, to lean toward the Palestinians, or to lean toward neither side, essentially be neutral. When you give that neutral option, uh, most Americans choose neutral, actually in general, but even on this issue. So we have, usually we, we have about three quarters of the American public say, we want the U.S. to lean toward neither side. But among those uh, that are, you know, one quarter to one third who say we want the U.S. to lean to one side or the other, historically we've had about anywhere from three to one to four to one uh, in favor of Israel, among that determined constituency. If you look at uh, the most recent poll we did on this, which is in uh, last August, um, we find that uh, among Democrats, uh, we have 71% uh, say we want the U.S. to lean ni toward neither side, 17% say we want the U.S. to lean toward Israel, 8% say we want the U.S. to lean toward the Palestinians. So the ratio is two to one, and, it's all, and, the, and those who want the U.S. to take side are only 25%. Among Republicans, only 45% say uh, they want the U.S. to take neither side, and 50%, 50% say they want the U.S. to take the side of Israel. Only 1% say they want the U.S. to take the side of the Palestinians. Uh, a ratio of 50 to 1 as opposed to 2 to 1. And by the way, among independents, it's almost identical to the Democrats on this one. So Republicans stand out, and if you break down the constituency uh, of those who say Israel, it tends to be mostly white males uh, um, uh, and, uh, you know, the, the minorities and females tend to be uh, much more uh, neutral. I wouldn't say there's a huge constituency for both states. It's really between neutral and being pro-Israel because it's primarily more in that line. More importantly for American foreign policy, when you ask the public how they rank the issue of the Arab-Israeli conflict among American interests, Republicans rank this issue higher than Democrats and independents. And so that is why, by the way, when Prime Minister Netanyahu comes to the U.S. and gives a lecture in Congress, he's more catering to the evangelical right in the Republican Party than he is to American Jews who every uh, poll showed are likely to stick with the president, even when his numbers were down among them. In fact, the Jewish American constituency is probably the second strongest supporter of the president after African Americans. Uh, and almost regardless of what happens on Israel, there's fluctuation, as I said, you know, more of 10 to 15 percent across the board. But that is not the main, the main issue for, uh, for Democratic and Republican uh, divide. I wonder, um, if we, I wonder if we might move to Dahlia now. Is, is that okay? That, that's fine. I, what I, let me just then say just a couple of things. Um, uh, I, I uh, have certainly attitudes. Um, uh, I'd like to talk about maybe in the, in the, in the second round uh, with um, data on um, how Americans are divided among Republicans and Democrats on the Iran issue uh, and how Americans are divided on the Arab Spring issue because those are two uh, issues that are important and there are important differences uh, uh, between the Democratic constituencies and the Republican constituencies uh, on those issues. So I'd like to talk about them, but maybe we'll do it after the, in okay, the second round. Okay, we'll round. come back to that. Dahlia, uh, are, among Muslims, is there a, uh, 
is there, in the, Muslim, in the Muslim world writ large, is there a lot of focus on the American elections and are, are they following it and do they, have, um, uh, do they have strong attitudes that stand out? Well, thank you, first of all, uh, for the question. Thanks to all of you for making it up so early this morning. I'm, I'm going to focus my talk a lot more um, on the region specifically and, and actually a lot of it on, on Egypt, just so that we can get some specificity in, in the five minutes that we have. So I won't, I won't talk about um, Muslims at large. But what I think is, is so interesting is the shift in attention. Uh, in 2008, Gallup asked whether or not people around the world believed the election in the U.S. was consequential to them, if it mattered in their lives. And at that time, the majority of Egyptians, they were actually the most likely in the region, said that it mattered, that it actually impacted their lives. And today I think that answer would be very different. Uh, we, we asked Egyptians what they thought were the priorities of uh, the next government, and, and foreign policy simply didn't make the list. Uh, it, in fact, the list looked very similar to what we would expect in the United States. Jobs, economic development, security and stability, and education. So I think one of the biggest shifts in, in the aftermath of the Arab uprisings is that people's attention is, you know, for, for the first time in a very long time, on their own elections. Uh, now, having said that, uh, I think it's important to understand what the region and specifically a country like Egypt might be expecting from the next president. What, what are they looking for in, in this kind of uh, a new relationship? Well, some things to, to just set the stage. Approval of U.S. leadership hasn't actually fluctuated a whole lot. Uh, there was a spike after the Cairo address. It came back down. And it stayed pretty much around 18, 19% approval for the past several years and, and hasn't really changed since the uprisings. Um, so so there's, there's a bit of a stability. Having said that, though, there has been a, a negative uh, turn in regards to American intervention or, or American... Um, influence in, in Egypt and specifically in Egyptian politics. So I think one of the, the most interesting shifts is the, the backlash and, and the rejection of um, economic aid in Egypt. Uh, there, it's, it's around 80% say that economic aid from the U.S. is a bad thing for the country, which is really remarkable um, having being the, the second most, um, the second highest recipient of aid. Now, where there is a lot more interest is in, is in business partnerships and investment. So I think what we'll see more and more of is the Egyptian public looking to the United States as a business partner rather than as a, a source of aid. The other thing that I, I think is very interesting to, to keep track of is that even though approval of U.S. leadership is around 19 percent, around 40 percent think closer relations with the United States is a good thing for the country. So far more people want to continue to work on the relationship and to, to grow closer to the United States than those who actually approve of leadership or who look to uh, the U.S. Uh, as, as a source of aid. Uh, I, think, and that, I think that's an important point to also keep in mind. And before I, I uh, let us kind of go to the next topic, I'd like to talk a little bit about the, the same kinds of things, the Palestinian-Israeli conflict and specifically the, the peace treaty, Camp David Accord, you know, unlike the United States, uh, where there is such a sharp divide along um, political party lines in regards to the views on these issues, what was so surprising to us is that in Egypt, 
supporters of the Muslim Brotherhood affiliated party, the Freedom and Justice Party, the, the Salafi and Nur Party, or the Free Egyptians, which, which is a much more secular, um, in fact, a secular uh, liberal party started by a Christian Egyptian, had no differences at all between them in regards to their views on uh, the Camp David Accord, that across the board, Egyptians were divided almost exactly in half. Half of Muslim Brotherhood supporters think the peace treaty is a good thing for the country, half don't. Half of the liberals think it's a good thing for the country, and half don't. And I think that that's important as we think about engaging Egypt, that it won't, it's not about uh, cheering for the right party to be in power. It really, in, on this topic, it actually doesn't matter. There's, there's, they're divided across the middle, regardless of who they support. It's going to have to be an engagement, a deep engagement with the Egyptian people around this topic, rather than choosing or, or cheering for uh, one party versus another. And I'll leave it. Before, before we move to Bill, I wonder if I could just ask a follow-up question. I find fascinating the, the statistics about, uh, that, that you gave us about attitudes toward U.S. aid and attitudes toward moving closer to the United States. So there has to be a significant number of Egyptians in that statistic who really dislike U.S. aid but also want to move closer to the United States. Yes. And I wondered if you could give us a sense of, of an individual who held the, those views, how he or she is putting together the world what, what is it that's wrong with aid and why do they want to move closer to the United States? I think that's a great question. Aid, those who are against aid see it as a type of economic slavery. They, they, are, they perceive aid to have hurt Egypt's ability to sustain itself, to be independent in its um, policies, both foreign and domestic. And, and they essentially associate with the former regime. So aid is seen as a tool of manipulation. Uh, now, while holding that view, they still see the United States as a partner they want to, um, to have a different kind of relationship with. Uh, one sentiment that's very strong in Egypt is they, they want to, they look at the world uh, and want to negotiate a completely different kind of interaction. They really do want a relationship of partnership and of equals. And they think, they, they feel that being a direct recipient of economic aid hurts the ability for them to be seen as uh, as equals, and I'll just, and you know, since we're specifically talking about uh, relating an engagement on foreign policy, that, you know, Shibli, you, you mentioned Iran, and, and that could potentially become uh, a foreign policy issue or an issue in the elections. When it comes to intervention, generally, so economic intervention, or specifically when it comes to direct aid, and, and there are ways to administer aid, and there are ways for us to, I think, creative ways to engage on economic aid that can be very constructive. But in terms of public opinion on its face value, there's a knee-jerk reaction against it. Economic aid is, is, is not something that's easy, but when it comes to military aid or military interventions, it's even more complicated. There is a misperception out there that there was widespread excitement or approval uh, on uh, when it comes to the NATO intervention in Libya, and that's simply not the case. Across the region, in, in Egypt, but elsewhere as, as well, um, the views were at best mixed, and in many places, the majority actually opposed the, the military intervention in, in Libya, and I think that it, it's very similar when it comes to Syria. While people overwhelmingly support the rebels, they are, they are much more uh, weary of Western interventions in these conflicts. Fascinating. Bill, if we could turn to you, uh, I wonder if you could uh, take some of the, the raw data that uh, Shibley gave us about Republican and Democratic attitudes and, and uh, tell us if there are really significant implications uh, uh, of this elect for Middle East policy of this electoral contest. The answer to your question in a word is yes, there are. And let me try to explain. 
I have a lot to put on the table and only five minutes to do it. So let me make three preliminary points and then get down to details. Uh, first of all, for those of you who are interested in American politics, this election will be close, hard fought, and negative. If the election were held tomorrow, Mr. Obama would probably win with a very narrow majority, but of course the election is not going to be held tomorrow, and Mr. Romney has been gaining strength over the past month. Second preliminary point, the American public, apparently like the Egyptian public, is very much focused inward at this point. To a greater extent than in any time in at least two decades, the focus is on the economy, jobs, economic growth, opportunity, particularly for children and young adults. Uh, and foreign policy is barely on the radar screen for most American voters right now. Uh, that, is a bad, that is bad news for Barack Obama, who gets relatively high marks for his conduct of foreign policy. And in different circumstances, that would be a big electoral advantage, but not this year. The only thing, in my judgment, that could change that would be a major foreign policy crisis, for example, over Iran and a military confrontation, a topic to which we may wish to return later. Despite low public attention and focus on foreign policy during the 2012 election, this election will be consequential for that set of issues uh, for two reasons. Number one, there are significant differences between the two candidates on key issues affecting this region. And second, as Americans know and as many others uh, are becoming aware, the U.S. Constitution gives the president and the executive branch much greater powers with respect to the conduct of foreign policy than domestic policy where Congress really has the upper hand. I think you're all aware of the broad contours of Mr. Obama's foreign policy, so let me speak very briefly about Mr. Romney's. A few general points. Uh, let me characterize the Romney approach so far as a combination of Ronald Reagan's rhetoric and George W. Bush's foreign policy <laughs> specifics. Three quarters of Mr. Romney's inner circle of advisors uh, have been drawn from Bush administration veterans, not always the case, uh, and this has given rise to some misgivings in the Republican establishment of what's left of it. For details, see a major article in today's New York Times. The broad themes of the Romney campaign American exceptionalism, a rejection of apologies for past American conduct, and a strategy of peace through strength, which leads Mr. Romney to be critical of the proposed cuts in the defense budget that are now on the table. Uh, details, uh, big power diplomacy, Romney would be much tougher on both China and Russia. He has said that he would declare China a currency manipulator on day one of his administration. With Russia, he's called for, quote, a reset of the reset. He doesn't think we've gotten very much out of our new uh, post-2009 strategy vis-a-vis -vis Russia. Afghanistan, if Mr. Romney becomes president, he will halt and perhaps even reverse the scheduled drawdown of American forces. Syria, a big difference has emerged in the past two days. Let me read a statement that the Romney campaign recently issued, quote, the Anand peace plan, which President Obama still supports, has merely granted the Assad regime more time to execute its military onslaught. And here's the money sentence. The United States should work with partners to organize and arm Syrian opposition groups so they can defend themselves. Close quote. Uh, the Arab Spring. I think a Romney, a, a Romney administration would be a disappointment to many in the region on that score. There would be, as far as I can tell, no new aid on the table, at most a better coordination of efforts that are now scattered across different parts of the American foreign policy landscape. Uh, Israel-Palestine, for reasons that I think Shibley has amply documented, a Romney administration would be in near complete alignment with the Israeli government. There would be a cessation of pressure on the Israeli government to move towards peace negotiations. No pressure, no preconditions. Uh, instead, I think an effort to strengthen frayed relationships between Israel and Egypt and between Israel and, and Turkey. 
Uh, in today's newspaper, you saw a discussion of serious considerations within the Israeli government to unilateral steps uh, to establish a provisional border, et cetera. So stay, tu stay tuned on that. The one area, and this is where I'll conclude, where there's not a lot of daylight between the two, interestingly, is with, with regard to Iran. Uh, the, uh, you know, the program that uh, the Romney campaign, and Mr. Romney himself, put on the table with regard to Iran is hard to distinguish either rhetorically or substantively uh, from that of the Obama administration. It is surprisingly cautious in the circumstances. However, circumstances change. I wonder if we could stay with you for a second, Bill, and just to expand a little bit on the, on the Iran question. Um, we're engaged right now in, uh, in talks with the Iranians over, the, uh, over their nuclear program. Uh, I think a, a conservative evaluation would say that it's unlikely that those talks are going to result in a major deal by the time of the, of the election. Um, and by the time we have the election, it, there, may be well, there may well be a public perception that the talks are absolutely are going nowhere and are even helping the Iranians. Does, this, does the timeline of the elections and the timeline of the talks, um, is, is there, I perceive a tension there? Am I, am I right in perceiving that? And does it have any kind of electoral implications? Well, there's certainly less than full congruity uh, because I believe, I, I believe that the talks will no, not go past a third round before they are declared either to have succeeded or have failed. And that third round is likely to occur no later than July. Uh, there are persistent rumors, of course, that there may be action between the failure of the talks, if they do fail, and the American election in November. There are three or four months to play with there. You mean military action? Military action. Not by the United States, I don't think. Mm. Uh, and, you know, and those are the circumstances under which foreign policy could be elevated dramatically on the American political landscape and both the administration and the Romney campaign would be challenged to respond to rapidly shifting events. Shibley, let's, let's just go with that and uh, take it as a hypothetical that the, that the talks are pronounced a failure. Uh, what do you see then uh, with respect to the, the relationship between the Obama administration and, and Israel? Well, I'll go a little further. Uh, even if they aren't pronounced as a failure, if they're perceived as a failure come July or August, uh, I think the pressure will mount um, on the administration. Iran will become a campaign issue. And part of the reason for it is the Israelis clearly want it. The Israelis' preference obviously is for the U.S. to carry out an attack. Uh, it, 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 this creates a certain pressure uh, on the Obama administration. And obviously, uh, the Romney campaign will exploit it. But let me say there are risks for Romney on this. It's not a freebie. While the Israelis are in a position, in a way, to, to hike it up or down, depending on the, on the tension level, um, the Romney campaign has some risks in focusing on a military option uh, on Iran. Here's why. The American public uh, does see Iran as a strategic threat. I mean, this, there's a consensus in our politics, Democrats and and Republicans uh, see Iran as a strategic threat. And there's a consensus that Iran should not be allowed to have nuclear weapons. But what we see in the public opinion is two things. Number one is a majority of Americans, including Republicans, uh, don't believe that a military strike is likely to stop Iran. It only delay its nuclear program. So they agree with that assessment that is coming out of our bureaucracies. Number two, when you ask them whether they prefer a military action or to give diplomacy, quote, more time, both Republicans and Democrats, and also independents, say give, di give diplomacy more time. Although obviously, at what time? And if, if July comes and then there's failure, uh, that, that, that is fluid. But the problem for Romney is the American public obviously uh, does not want to see another entanglement, uh, war entanglement in the Middle East, by and large, mm -hmm. unless it's you know, thrust upon us in, in some way. And because independents are more uh, closer to Republicans on economics than they are on foreign policy, independents actually are much closer to Democrats on foreign policy. 
and much closer to Republicans of economics. The minute you shift the focus from economics to foreign policy, you're going to start having independence go in a different direction. Even there is a thread within the Republican Party, the libertarian thread that we've seen in the Ron Paul and beyond, that is very reluctant to want to intervene. And that's why the Romney campaign has been very cautious in the way it's handling it. So there are risks for Romney, uh, but it may be that Israel will be uh, in a position to, to, to play with this depending on how the politics of it play themselves out. Well, could you expand on that a little bit? Let me ask you to switch from uh, analysis of American public opinion to, to uh, the analysis of the Israeli leadership. How, how do you think Netanyahu is reading all of the, um, uh, this, this picture that you just put before us? Is he, is he going to conclude uh, uh, that, let, let's, let's, let's assume that he is inclined to take military action, a big assumption. Is he going to conclude that it's better to do it before the election or after the election? Well, it's a good question. Uh, I mean, obviously, he's keeping all of us guessing. And, and in fact, um, uh, up until, I would say, six months ago, the interpretation in Washington, he was primarily bluffing uh, to put pressure on the U.S. and also maybe to undermine Netanyahu because there's a consensus among many in Washington that he would like to see Obama defeated. He's also a close friend of Romney's. And, and as I said, you know, the, the, the Republican Party is closer to him. So, so there was that consensus, but that shifted. And I think both within Israel among analysts and also within the U.S. within the U.S. bureaucracy, there's an assessment that the uh, it's not a bluff. Maybe it's partly a bluff that he there is a political aim, but that the Israelis are serious and they're serious for a variety of reasons. They see a window of opportunity. Um, they see a time horizon that is closing for Iran. Uh, they think they can uh, do it, uh, and and they may have some more information than we do. Obviously, they have more information than we do on this one. Uh, so so it's, it's a serious threat. I don't think it's just a bluff. Uh, but their timing has to be, their, their absolute preference is for the U.S. to do it. There's no question about that. No one doubts that at all. And so if, in fact, Romney is going to win and Romney is prepared to do it, it's a different story. If it looks like Obama is going to win and the window will close, I'm speculating. Uh, I'm saying that if politics is part of it related to the timing, of Israel doing what it think it must do or must be done by it or by the U.S., there is no question that it's a dynamic game. I don't think it's something uh, that, that, you know, that's disconnected. Mm. Dahlia, uh, how, are, uh, how are publics in the Middle East looking at this, uh, this really incredible drama between, uh, between President Obama and Prime Minister Netanyahu? Well, I, you know, I think that uh, they... It's, it's, it's interesting, I was, uh, I think I was talking to someone at the conference about the, the huge disconnect in perceptions when it comes to this issue, where, where the president will make a statement, say about 67 border, um, and he, he gets almost no credit for it in the region. They think, well, of course, what, what else would we be starting with in terms of negotiations? But on the other side, it's, it's a huge deal and how, and, and he's, he's uh, He's given such a such a gift to the Palestinian side, and and, and he gets in a lot of trouble for it. So I, I think that the the dynamic between Obama and Netanyahu and the tension that we read so much about in in the U.S. press isn't really making its way to public opinion awareness. Mm. Uh, what I think, you know, coming back to Iran though, what I think has been very interesting to, to see in our research is how approval of Iranian leadership has actually been steadily decreasing. And especially over the past 18 months since the Arab uh, uprising, um, it's, it's just been, it hasn't sort of stayed flat like U.S. leadership, it's, it's been coming steadily down. Uh, and now, surprisingly maybe, uh, fewer people approve of Iranian leadership in Egypt than approve of U.S. leadership. Uh, also... Could, sorry, if I could interrupt. Can you give us a sense of the differential? It's about 12% approve of, of Iranian leadership versus about 19% uh, who approve of U.S. leadership. 
The other thing to keep in mind is when Egyptians are asked if, if there is a country that they see as a political model. So we, we ask the question as an open end. We don't give them options to choose from. Iran just isn't mentioned. Whereas a significant you know, percentage, say the United States, between 10 and 15%. Uh, so Iran is a not, not seen very favorably. It's, it's not, it's not um, looked at certainly as a model. But at the same time, and, and I think Shibley research finds the same thing, it's not also seen as a threat. So it's, it's, not, um, it's not looked at favorably, but at the same time not seen as a threat. I do think, however, if there is an attack on Iran, uh, and, and we have looked at this, if Arab publics, including Gulf publics, believe that an, uh, an attack on Iran is, is justified, the answer, the, the vast majority is no. Attacking Iran would be seen as uh, unjustified by Israel or the United States. By both. By both. By both. Is, have you looked at the at the different? Are they the same? It's it, disapproval of Israel and disapproval of the United States is is is, is we equal haven't or? we haven't looked at both. Uh, we haven't asked you know if it's done by Israel or done by the United States. We've we've looked at Amer an American attack mm. and that was uh, seen as unjustified. I I am fairly certain that if we asked about Israel, it would, it would be very right. similar. Um, so an attack on Iran would likely increase sympathy toward the, toward the Islamic Republic. But the, the implication of what you're saying is that there's a, a, a significant gulf between the public perception of Iran as a threat and the elite perception. Absolutely. Uh, interesting. Uh, Bill, I wonder if I could uh, put you in uh, President Obama's shoes uh, and uh, uh, Give us a sense of how, um, as he's coming up to the election, uh, and he has these these problems to contend with, uh, uh, the, the the threat of an Israeli attack. Uh, what kind of calculations is he making? He is hoping, perhaps to get, uh, against hope, that he can get to November without having to confront this question, right? because. I'm fairly, I'm fairly certain that if the Israelis attacked, the United States would not come in behind them militarily, not in this administration mm. and perhaps not in any administration. I think Romney's relatively cautious rhetoric on that question is instructive because he has not been equally cautious in many other areas. Mm. Uh, and so you know, the question is much more one of the response that an Obama administration would make publicly, rhetorically, and diplomatically, rather than military, militarily, and what kind of daylight that might open up with a Romney campaign. Uh, for example, you know, here's, one, here, you know, here's one poll to consider. 1956, yeah. okay, where the United States was flatly opposed to Israeli, French, and, and British intervention in the Suez crisis. I don't think that the Obama administration would come out and reject or denounce Israeli action. How full-throated in support would they be? That would be a moment of truth for the Obama administration's foreign policy in the entire region. If you know, if the administration felt that it had no choice but to be initially full-throated in its support of the action, whatever their private reservations, I believe, and I'm not an expert, uh, that that would be enormously consequential for a range of other foreign policy objectives that the administration is trying to pursue in the region. On the other hand, if they're not, you can be very sure that the Romney response would be full-throated support, and at that point, you would have a major foreign policy debate. And if the issue is not American intervention, but rather the vigor of American support for Israeli intervention, that is a distinction with a difference in the American, in, in the American people's mind, and I suspect very strongly that that would not play out favorably for Obama, at least in the short term. I'm, you know, I'm piling speculation on top of speculation here, but I think, I think the administration, to summarize, would face real tension 
between its foreign policy objectives long term in the region and its political objectives short term in the American electorate. Let, let's just, as, let, let me pile a little bit more speculation. <laughs> Is it possible? I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm, I'm very influenced by the studies that show that great scientific insight really comes from speculation rather than uh, actual data. So, uh, so called wags. <laughs> so let's assume, that, let's assume that Prime Minister Netanyahu has your analysis. Uh, exactly as you just stated it, of the, uh, of the uh, electoral implications of a, an Israeli attack. Uh, and let's uh, again assume that he actually wants to take action or has decided that he has no choice but to take action. When is he going to do it in order, to, in order to get the full effect of this differential in American... Uh... Okay. Uh, you asked me to play Obama, now I'll play Netanyahu. You know, I sort of jump across the net and hit the ball back to myself. Uh, based on my understanding of American politics and the flow of American politics, uh, Mr. Netanyahu would be very ill-advised to do anything in the month of October. Uh, that would be seen as totally political, A, and B, the early response of the American people in a foreign policy crisis is always to rally around the president. Mm. So if I were going to do something, I would not wait until October. I would perhaps, I, I would perhaps do something in August. Why August? Well, uh, August, people tend to take vacations. The administration would be scattered. Uh, Mr. Obama would probably be forced to improvise a response from Martha's Vineyard, uh, and uh, you know, and there would be plenty. There would plenty be plenty of time for the issue to play out in the fall campaign after the initial rally around the president uh, impulse had had uh, had dissipated. Uh, I would also say, if I were Netanyahu, I would figure that I would win either way. Here's why. Uh, Either I would force the Obama administration to align itself more firmly with me, undermining other administration objectives in the region that Netanyahu doesn't much like anyway, or he would, that failing, he would enhance Romney's electoral prospects. Mm -hmm. So, you know, if a given action is win-win politically, then the question arises, why not? Uh, and there are many things to be said on the other side. How many of those things have an impact on Mr. Netanyahu will, remains to be seen. Yeah. Well, of course, we're assuming that he's inclined to action. Well, my, we are, aren't we? My, my, <laughs> own, my own view is that, he, that, is that he'd be foolhardy to do it. And so the, the best thing to do would, go, would be to, knowing he's not going to do it, pretend that he made a big concession and try to get a promise from Obama that if Obama wins the election, he'll come to his aid. Because he'll have Romney because of American public opinion and the, the best he can do is play to, to Obama's better angels. But anyway, that's another speculation. So uh, we should turn it over to questions, but before we do that, let me just see if, uh, let me just run down the panel here and see if you have final thoughts. Shibley, I think you must have uh, had some thoughts when you heard all this. Uh, no, I, I, I mean, I, I agree with what Bill said about the timing. Uh, and, um, and there's no question that, uh, you know, either way, whether Netanyahu is serious or not, he will try to get some concessions. Uh, from either Obama or, or Romney or both. Uh, just one final remark, though, on the Arab Spring, because I think it's interesting. I mean, the, the, the Syria issue, uh, the American, this is not an issue for the American public. They're, they're, you know, they're saddened by what's happening. It's a tragedy. They want somebody to do something. They don't want it to be the U.S. Uh, by and large, uh, they see the Arab Spring still as a, as a positive thing, not a negative thing. The views of the Arabs have improved. There are differences among Republicans and Democrats on this one, uh, whereas um, Democrats uh, tend to more think this is about ordinary people wanting freedom. Republicans are divided between those who think this is an Islamist takeover attempt and, and also people who, who want freedom. So there are some differences in the broader attitudes toward the Arab Spring among Republicans and Democrats. Okay, Dahlia, final thoughts. Final thoughts. Uh, sometimes you hear the sentiment that the Arab Spring was, uh, was a plot of the U.S. or something that was an outsider's 
um, conspiracy. And, and we wanted to know how widespread this, this idea was, especially as things get harder and harder in many of these countries. We found it is a, a, a minority view, and that the vast majority of Arabs across the region do see the Arab Spring as an indigenous, organic movement for freedom. Um, and I think that does matter as, as we move forward in, in engaging this region. Bill. Well, my, f my final thought is very simple. American politics right now is as deeply polarized as it has been for more than 100 years. And that polarization, and I think Shibley's figures dramatize this, uh, will play out on the stage of foreign policy. I think it would be foolish to underestimate the extent of the difference of the basic instincts and political DNA, so to speak, of the Obama administration as opposed to the Romney campaign. The Romney campaign represents a break not only with the Obama administration, but also with a more cautious Republican foreign policy establishment. Uh, and uh, so it would be a consequential change if the change occurs. So you're, you're saying then that those aspects of the George W. Bush foreign policy that, that many members of the establishment found abrasive are now baked into the DNA of the Republican Party? Can we go that far? Uh, I think that is the majority tendency, and it will be, uh, you know, and, and given the, and the DNA reflects itself in the composition, I have studied the composition of the inner Romney circle of 23 key advisors. Three quarters of them are drawn from the ranks of the Bush administration and not the cautious wing of the Bush administration. Romney, for example, has cited John Bolton as a model UN ambassador uh, and says that he would like to find a UN ambassador on the model of John Bolton. Okay, fantastic. Uh, we've got about <laughs> ten, 10 minutes for questions. Uh, any questions? <coughs> Sir. I'm Howard Passell from Sandia National Labs in the United States. Well, we know that um, the public opinion among Muslims in the Middle East and maybe around the world uh, for the United States suffered uh, in the last decade, and I'm wondering if there's any signs that that is improving now. That if, that, if there's a sign that what? That uh, a public opinion among Muslims for the United States is improving. Uh, well, certainly not the most recent poll we did, eh, including the one in Egypt, and I think Gallup, maybe, maybe Dahlia could speak about that, but we've been tracing, I've been tracing it for a full decade. Uh, we really haven't seen any improvement, any, any major improvement in attitudes toward the U.S. Uh, we saw a little bit of it um, in, in the poll that we did on October 11th, in large part because people were mixed, actually, about the way the U.S. handled the Arab Spring. But by and large, uh, with the exception of a minor bump in 2009, right after Obama got elected, where there were more favorable views of him personally, without really being tr transferred into a major transformation of attitudes toward, uh, to, to, uh, toward the U.S., uh, we saw that reverse when they became disappointed with him. In the measures that we do, particularly in Egypt, but also in Saudi Arabia, Morocco, Jordan, Lebanon, and the United Arab Emirates, so they're all Arab states, I'm not speaking to Muslim world broadly. Uh, what we find is that over the past decade, the two biggest issues that determined Arab uh, outlook uh, were the Palestine-Israel question and the Iraq war. The Iraq war is now behind us. In the current Egyptian poll that we just conducted in May, um, the two-thirds focus on the Arab-Israeli issue as, as the main reason for the anger with the U.S. That's not likely to change. Uh, and uh, it's in, in some ways a mirror image of what happened in Israel where uh, Obama starts with uh, Israelis thinking of him negatively and uh, up this year, uh, actually more Israelis want him to win the elections than the Republican candidates. With Romney, he's pretty much tied within the margin of error. Yeah. I mean, I th we found very similar results in the Middle East. Now, in the broader Muslim-majority world, 
in Muslim Africa, Sub-Saharan Africa, Obama is very, very popular. Uh, but in fact, George Bush was very, very popular. So there hasn't been a significant improvement just because you have 80, 85 percent approval um, of U.S. leadership during the Bush era. And then in Asia, it's been surprisingly flat, not, not a whole lot of improvement um, in a place even like Indonesia. Uh, and the other thing I wanted to say that I think is, is important to keep in mind is the region where the, the relationship matters the most to people personally is right here in the Middle East. This is where people are paying the most attention and, and, and believe that the relationship between their region and the United States actually matters to their everyday lives. Uh, in the broader Muslim majority world in Sub-Saharan Africa and in Asia, the relationship isn't as big of a focus. Dalia, uh, on your, with regard to Egypt that you focused on before, did Obama get a significant bump? He did. Uh, I'll just share our numbers. So in 2008, before Obama was elected, the Egyptian public's approval of U.S. leadership was one of the lowest in the world. I think it was, um, I think it was only beaten by Syrian uh, <laughs> approval. And that, so the Egyptian approval was 6%, and Syrian approval was at that, that year 4%. And that was the lowest in the whole world. And then Egyptian public opinion actually shot up, <laughs> if you will, right after the Cairo address to 36%. So it went up significantly from 6 to 36 percent and then has since then uh, that since that initial spike come down and stayed at around 19 percent approval. Oh. Martin. Uh, one comment and two questions if I'm allowed. Um, the speculation uh, about uh, bombing Iran of course was based on an, an assumption uh, that I would challenge um, which was that, that the negotiations uh, will deadlock the third round, which is going to take place in June, and they'll be, uh, then they'll be called off. Um, I, th I think that's unlikely. Uh, I think that, that the Iranians facing uh, very severe sanctions kicking in in July uh, will find a way to make a concession. And, and uh, all of this speculation um, will become relevant not in August to October, but in the spring of next year when the negotiations really will break down, um, be just because I don't think there's a way to convince Iran to give up its nuclear ambitions. But, so I just wanted to make a cautionary note there that there is another possibility here, which is not necessarily a breakthrough, but just that the negotiations could produce something, not a total breakdown. Um, the question uh, I had for Dalia and, and Shibley is uh, about American attitudes to the rise of Islamist parties um, and, and that dimension of the, of the developments in, in the Arab awakenings. And do we have any sense of how Americans are viewing um, this uh, uh, rise of Islam again in the, in the uh, region? And for Bill, um, you know, one of the things I think Dalia would confirm is that that Arab public opinion liked about the Bush administration was its uh, robust uh, insistence on spreading democracy to the Middle East. Um, and I wonder whether there's any indication in your studies of uh, the president's, uh, of, excuse me, Freudian slip, of Romney's advisors, um, whether we're going to see that come back uh, in terms of... Uh, Romney's promotion of democracy in this part of the world and can therefore uh, Arabs expect that, that a Romney administration will actually be much more robust in its uh, support of uh, the uh, democratic transitions taking place here? Uh, uh, just, just quickly on uh, attitudes toward the rise of Islamist parties. Um, we, we haven't done anything specifically on that since the Muslim Brotherhood won the parliamentary election, because that really is sort of the measure. We, what we did is when we asked the question um, um, uh, back in August, and then we repeated another one in April, uh, particularly about the Arab Spring, um, we, there was already a lot of discourse here about this is all Islamic opposition, they're trying to take over. We put that out there as a proposition. Do you think it's 
mostly ordinary people uh, who are seeking freedom, or do you think it's mostly Islamic parties trying to take control? And what we had overall in the American public is a plurality say it's mostly ordinary people trying to seek free, uh, seeking freedom. Uh, a, good, a good number, you know, a, a minority, but a good minority saying it's about Islamic groups, and yet another uh, uh, significant minority saying uh, it's about both. If you, if you want to, you could look at it both ways. It, those who say it's Islamic parties and both Islamic parties and uh, ordinary people are a majority, or you could look at it the other way. Among Republicans, more people are inclined to think it's mostly about Islamic parties. Among, um, among Democrats, the other way around. Uh, it hasn't shift, changed the attitudes about support for rebels versus governments. In every country where there is uh, contention, starting with Yemen uh, and Bahrain and, and uh, Syria, um, when you ask them, do you sympathize more with the rebels or with the governments, overwhelming majority of Americans sympathize more with the rebels, regardless of how they interpret it. I mean, I, I think very little to add to what Shibli just said. I, um, I would say that it was interesting to see that at the time that the, uh, the actual protests were taking place in Egypt in, in February, 82% of, Egyptian, of Egyptians, we found later, supported the protesters. And almost exactly the same number of Americans, 80% 80, 80 of Americans, said that they sympathized with the protesters in Egypt um, opposing Mubarak. So there was this moment where there was this almost exact agreement and synthesis between the two populations in regards to, to how they were viewing uh, the, the uprising. Well, Martin, your question is both unexpected and interesting. Interesting in part because unexpected. Uh, and you've, you, you've, led me to, you've led me to reflect. Uh, thinking, you know, thinking about the major white paper on foreign policy that the Romney campaign put out with the full, you know, full imprimatur, full, you know, full military honors, so to speak. Uh, while there is a very robust invocation of American exceptionalism, a denunciation of the president for alleged apology tours and for weakness on defense, I think there is notably less emphasis on the export of democracy. Not none, but much less than was characteristic of the Bush administration at its apogee. And for example, if you look at the description the Romney campaign's description of our objectives in Afghanistan, they are notably narrow, much narrower than nation building, much narrower than democracy promotion, very much focused on core national security objectives. And the critique of the Obama administration is not narrow objectives, but rather means inadequate to obtain those narrow objectives. Uh, and while the while the uh, Romney approach to the Arab Spring does focus on conditionality of aid in order to promote a democratic transition, that is a somewhat less robust stance than the full, what I'll call the full Bush 43 on democracy promotion. I think that's a distinction with a, uh, with a difference. On the other hand, there are lots of people in the inner circle who would not necessarily be averse to a more forward-leaning rhetorical and perhaps even practical stance on democracy promotion. Best I can do. Time for one last laser-like question. Alan. Laser-like. Super laser-like, Alan. OK, briefly. Um, Alan Johnson from the Bread and Israel Communications Research Center in London. I, I found a, a slight air of unreality about the discussion about Iran. So briefly, and then a question. Um, Firstly, it's not an electoral consideration for Israel or a narrowly political consideration. It's an existential consideration. Um, secondly, the, there is no war party in Israel. And thirdly, the debate amongst the military, security, and political establishment has been utterly unprecedented in its breadth and its seriousness. And the second point would be there is a zone of immunity, and it is being approached. And the third point would be that this is not really about Israel. Two of the bitter fruits of an Iranian nuclear bomb would be, firstly, a nuclear arms race in the region, 
and secondly, a, a political and to some degree military cover for a series of spoilers and proxies in the region too who would cause untold damage. Now, given that Obama is committed not explicitly not to a containment regime but to prevention, if we skip to a second term Obama administration and we're closer to the zone of immunity and we're months down the line, where did the panel think Obama stands and how does he act come November, December, January? Okay. Shibley, why don't you start uh, us off? Well, just very quickly. I mean, uh, uh, of course, Iran is, a, is an international concern. And it's a concern for the U.S. The U.S. public and, and both parties uh, identify Iran as a strategic threat. But the urgency of the Iran issue is, is far more so for Israel. And it is far more so in terms of strategic threat to Israel than it is to the U.S. that the agenda and the timeline are very much influenced by the Israeli consideration. So don't, don't underestimate that. The second, regardless of the existential threat, everybody understands that a nuclear Iran would be a major strategic threat to Israel. The use of the term existential is hotly debated in Israel. And there are many, especially within the security establishment, who reject that use of terminology because they think you could wake up the next morning and you can have a nuclear Iran. And if you think that, uh, if you assume that they're not going to be deterred by the overwhelming power of Israel, then what would happen to the morale of the Israeli population if they think Iran at some point will use it? So there is a whole debate within the Israeli military establishment against the use of the extensional threat, uh, so much so that uh, Aluf Ben, the, uh, the, the editor of Haaretz after Netanyahu invoked this existential threat one more time in his speech in Congress, said, well, that means that he's already made a decision to go to war because you can't walk back from that rhetoric. I'm not sure that's true. I think you can back, walk back from that rhetoric, but I, I don't think it's a foregone conclusion. It's a strategic threat, an important one, needs to be countered. I'm not sure it's an existential threat. Bill? Well, uh, I was answering the questions put to me. If, if the issue is the, the tone, the temper, the substance of the debate within Israel, I absolutely agree with you. It has been broad, uh, extensive, extended, probing, uh, and public. And it is well known, it's, no, it's not a state secret, that there is major dissent within the Israeli military and within the Israeli intelligence establishment from what is seen in many quarters as a certain kind of heedlessness or recklessness on the part of uh, Mr. Netanyahu and the defense minister, Ehud Barak. Uh, and if there is an attack, uh, it will be very much a personal decision of the prime minister and the defense minister. Uh, I, would not, I would not expect a major rift within Israel after the attack, but you're absolutely right. There is one now, and it revolves around differing analyses of the nature of the threat, and also, to be blunt, whether the threat could be contained after the fact. Uh, and there is a, a pro-containment group within the Israeli elite, which is, I think, quite significant both politically and intellectually. So I don't regard this as a foregone conclusion, but the question posed to me had to do with the prime minister. And, uh, you know, and he is not simply a dependent variable of the Israeli elite. In some respects, he stands apart from it, even though he's part of it. Dahlia, do you have anything you want to add to that? I actually wanted to go back to Martin's question about um, the Bush administration's freedom agenda and would, would a, another Republican administration be perceived as being more supportive of a democratic transition? I think the answer is, at least from the point of view of the region, is no. And the reason I say that is we've been tracking perceptions of U.S. dedication to uh, promoting democracy, even well before the uprisings. Um, they were very negative at the time of the, of the height of the freedom agenda, and they, they, are, they really haven't gotten much better, but they certainly haven't gotten worse. So the, everything we've seen in, um, in our research indicates that the, the type of rhetoric around the freedom agenda and, and, the, and the type of um, policies that surrounded it, while 
may have been uh, favorably seen by some activists on the ground, the vast majority of the public felt that they were, they were hollow, they were hypocritical, and really associated them more with the Iraq war than with uh, organic movements of democracy. Okay, uh, please join me in thanking our panelists. This was uh, very informative, I appreciate it.